This is a review of Matter and Interactions. Here's the textbook, just so you, in case you haven't seen. This is Matter and Interactions, great textbook. Everyone should, should use it. Uh, for chapters 13 and 14, this is explicitly for my students who have not been in class for three weeks because of a hurricane. So this is the stuff that we've already done, okay? But it's very possible that you might have missed it or you might have forgotten it. And so I'm going to review so that we can get into the new stuff. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to do the basics. And I don't know how long this is going to take. I'm just going to jump into it. The idea behind matter and interactions is interactions. So we have the gravitational interaction. We have interaction between particles. We have the electric interaction. We have the magnetic interaction. And, and that's what this semester focuses on is the electric and magnetic interactions along with matter and how those, how those relate. And that's a lot of physics right there. So chapter 13 starts off with uh, the electric field. So if we have a positive charge, then we can imagine the space around that as having some type of field of influence or some, some field. And we call that the electric field. So if I have, uh, let's actually do this in the most explicit way possible. Let's say this is the charge Q and the vector location of that is RQ. And then I have another, uh, I'll put it right here actually, a point right there, I'll call that RO for the observation location. And I want to find the electric field due to this charge at that point. So I need this vector R and this would be the electric field E. So we can find the vector R. Uh, R is RO minus RQ, right? Because it's just the difference between these two vectors. And that's that vector R. And then the electric field would be E equals one over four pi epsilon naught, which is just a constant. Okay, some textbooks just call that K, times the value of that charge Q divided by the magnitude of this vector R. So the magnitude of vector R squared. And then in order to make this an electric field vector, that's a scalar, scalar, scalar. I need to multiply it by the unit vector R hat in the direction of R. So just remember that if R is a vector Rx, Ry, Rz, it has those components. The magnitude of the vector would be the square root of Rx squared plus Ry squared plus Rz squared. I'm going to uh, link a uh, introduction to vector and review of vectors down below uh, because I'm not going to go into everything. And then the unit vector r hat is defined as the vector r divided by the mag Ooh, that's magnitude divided by the magnitude of the vector r. And so if I put all these in, I can get the uh, electric field as a vector due to that point charge. Um, so also one over four pi epsilon naught, the constant is equal to nine times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per coulomb squared, where coulomb is a unit for charge. Okay, what if I put a charge right there? So call that Q1. What if I put another charge there, Q2? If I put a charge in a region with the electric field, then there's a force F equals Q2 E. So if I put a charge in an electric field E, it will experience a force that's just a product of those two. Which is the same for gravity, right? We have the same idea of F equals mg. G is the gravitational field in newtons per kilogram. If I multiply it by a mass, then I get the gravitational force. And this is actually the gravitational field due to the Earth. And that's a mass near the Earth. Same idea. Okay, moving right along. So what if I have more than one charge? So let's say I have this, I have Q1, I shouldn't have put that right there, and then you have a negative charge, Q2, and I wanna find the electric field right there. Well, in that case, I find first the electric field due to Q1, which would be pointing away from that because it's a positive charge, E1. And then I can find the electric field due to E, that's a two, two, E2. And then the total electric field would be E, no, 
E equals E1 plus E2. So this is called superposition. This says that the total electric field at any location is just the vector sum of the individual electric fields. So here I have two charges. I could do the same thing for 10 charges. I could do the same thing for 100 charges. It doesn't matter. If I want to find the electric field at some point, I just find the individual electric fields due to the individual charges, and then I add them all up as vectors. You have to add them up as vectors. Okay, so then that, of course I would need this vector R1 for that one, this vector here for R2 uh, for that one, uh, and there you go. Now one example of the electric field uh, due to two charges is the electric field due to a dipole. So we define a dipole, here's the x-axis, I'll put it like here, and that's the y-axis. Let's say I have a positive charge right here and an equal and opposite negative charge right there separated by a distance s. So we'll call this q. That's minus q and that's plus q. And I want to find the electric field over here some distance r away. This is on the axis of that. So what we do is uh, this is like a neutral object since it has a positive and negative charge, but it's still going to make an electric field. Because I have two electric fields, I have the electric field due to the positive charge, which would be this way. I'll call that E plus. And then I have the electric field due to the negative charge, which is this way, E minus. But you'll notice that E plus is greater than E minus because the positive charge is closer to this point than the negative charge. So when you add these two up, even though they have equal and opposite charges, the electric fields do not cancel. I made a derivation for this. Uh, I'll, I think I did, uh, but it's also in the book. Uh, I'm pretty sure I did, and I'll link that down below. But in the end, uh, if we're very, if the distance r is much greater than the distance s between the distance between these two. Uh, so remember, this is s over 2 that way, and this is s over 2 that way. Uh, then the magnitude of that electric field, we call this E axis, because the electric field along the axis of a dipole would be equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught 2 q s over r cubed. And that's just the magnitude, it's not the vector. Then we could do the same thing for uh, the electric field along this axis. And in this case, uh, the two electric fields, here's E plus and here's E minus. And so the, the vertical components of these vectors act exactly cancel because these two distances are the same. So the, the total electric field would be that way on the axis. And we get this E perpendicular is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught qs over r cubed. And both of these only work if uh, r is much greater than s. And you can get these approximations. And I'm pretty sure I did both of these. And if I didn't, then I don't know what else to say. Uh, but when you use these, uh, it turns out that dipoles appear in a lot of places and are very useful. So these approximations are very helpful. Now, if I have, if I want to find the electric field right there, neither of these two work then I'd have to use just normal superposition and find this distance and that distance and use that to find the, electric, the two electric fields and add them up as vectors. Okay, moving right along. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of stuff here. Don't think, oh, I got it. You have to work these problems and it takes a long time. Okay. Uh, okay, what if I have, uh, this is something that, that comes up quite a bit. What if I have a Un a, a sphere with charge on the surface, uniformly distributed. It turns out that uh, inside of this sphere, anywhere inside that sphere, if this is uniformly distributed, then E inside is equal to the zero vector, which is zero, zero, zero newtons per coulomb. Uh, so that's not the same thing as just the number zero, the zero vector. Okay. And you can imagine why. If I pick this point right there inside, well, that charge is very close. It's going to make an electric field pointing down. This charge is going to be a small one pointing up. But all these other ones make electric fields that also point up. And there's some more that down. And if you add them all up, 
it turns out that you get exactly zero. If you're in the center, it seems obvious that the total electric field to be zero because every point has an equal and opposite point on the other side that pushes it away. Uh, I think I want to make uh, a numerical model showing how this works, uh, but I'll make that in a separate video. If you're outside of the sphere, if I'm over here, then the uh, some vector r e out is equal to one over four pi epsilon naught. I'll put this as well, not big Q for the total charge over r squared r hat. So if you're outside a uniformly charged sphere, the electric field looks just like the electric field due to a point charge focused at the center. And we've already done something like this. We did this with the gravitational field. If I have the Earth, and here's some continents, something like that, and I'm over here, I don't, I don't, if this is, uni actually doesn't have to be on the surface. It only has to be spherically distributed uniformly. A uniformly spherical distri distribution, then the gravitational field uh, is as though this is all at, this, at the center of the Earth. And the same thing's true here. Okay, and again, I'll, I'll show you that at some point uh, numerically. Um, okay, so now uh, that's chapter 13 is all about the electric field due to a point charge and due to uh, more than one point charge, dipoles or charge distributions like that. Uh, chapter 14 is, is more conceptual. It's, it's about matter. So if I have uh, some material, there's actually two kinds of matter. There's uh, conductors and insulators. I, I don't want to really draw these, but insulators. So in a conductor, we have positive atomic cores. So this would be things like metals. Uh, positive atomic cores... And then we have, I should use red, or I'll use green. Uh, and in here we also have these electrons, uh, which the book calls a sea of electrons. And it turns out that in a conductor, these outer electrons are able to move around and switch between cores. And that's what makes it a conductor. In an insulator, we also have positives and negatives, but they're kind of paired up. And I'm drawing these on the side, which is not completely perfect right now. I'm just, uh, it will make sense in a second. So an insulator would be something like glass, plastic, um, stuff that charges are not free to move about from one thing to the next. So what happens is if I apply an external electric field here, then this is going to uh, push all these free charges, so they actually will move this way and shift this way, and that will leave on the other side, I'll draw it over here, uh, uh, positive cores without an electron next to them. So overall, it kind of looks like this. If I just draw the excess charges, I have negatives, and positives. So these charges will move and then they actually do that to make the net electric field inside equal to zero. So a conductor in equilibrium has an electric field inside of equal to zero. If it's not zero inside, then those charges are going to move. Uh, an insulator, if you apply an electric field, these will also polarize. These atoms in here will make a temporary dipoles, and they will also produce an electric field. But you do not get an electric field of zero inside of an insulator. But we can say, uh, we can define a dipole as a dipole moment P, which is Q times S. Remember, if I have a dipole, uh, and let's say this is minus and plus, and that's a distance, that's plus, a distance S, and those are Q. QS defines the, the dipole moment. It turns out that an induced dipole uh, is some constant alpha 
times the applied electric field magnitude. So the greater the electric field that you apply, the more those things stretch apart and create a, a larger electric dipole. Uh, okay, so what if I do have a constant electric field inside of a, of a metal, then these electrons will actually accelerate, but they collide with the atomic cores and kind of interact with them. So overall, they speed up and slow down and speed up and slow down to give some average velocity, and we call this the drift velocity. And this is going to be really important later. So the drift velocity, we use V bar, right, for average velocity. And it's just equal to uh, the electron mobility times the uh, applied electric field. I'll just call that E net. And this is a scalar e expression. Um, then there's all these things about charging and discharging uh, materials. They have a great example about uh, what happens when you pull two pieces apart. Uh, we don't create, well, we can create and destroy electric charge, but, but only in pairs. So I could take uh, something like this. If this is an electron and this is a positron, uh, I actually can, they can annihilate and be gone. Uh, or I can create them in pairs. But I can't create just one single charge. And that's because electric charge is conserved. So if I create a negative, I have to create a positive. If I destroy a negative, I have to destroy a positive too. Um, okay, I think that's a good enough right now for chapter 13 and 14. Um, to get you started. Definitely read back over those chapters, um, and, and if we have any questions, let me know, uh, and we'll talk about some of those things in class. But hopefully that's enough to get you back up to speed.